So we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about inelastic scattering. And fortunately, as opposed to the, radi the, the radiometry thing I gave yesterday, I could have gone for another several hours, I think, because there was enough stuff I didn't get to talk about. This one, I think I have a better, can stay within an hour much easier. So here we are. We'll talk about inelastic scattering. Um, remember, everybody, they took their physics class and you, they seemed to spend forever on collisions and trying to figure out how collisions work. And uh, there were two types of collisions that you had, inelastic and elastic. Do you remember what the deal was? What's the difference between the two things? Anybody remember freshman physics? Yeah. <laughs> See, I bring this stuff up because for the last 10, 15 years, that's the class I teach is freshman physics for engineers or for life science. And I, I teach the part that I think is fun, but I don't think anybody ever remembers it when you're done. So, but anyway, I don't do this part very often. But do you remember the difference between inelastic and elastic collisions? Inelastic um, loses kinetic energy, and so um, there you don't lose energy, right? The energy is conserved totally, but somewhere the energy goes off somewhere else. Anyway, so that yeah, so basically, elastic collisions conserve kinetic energy momentum. Inelastic just momentum, and energy isn't really lost; it's converted somewhere else to heat or something like that. So, in elastic scattering. Um, it's basically easy. Photons come in and they go out with the same energy. And so if you know that they have the same energy from what we've learned about photons, and I'll use the term photons a lot here, um, when you, you know that they could go out with the same wavelength. So they come in with some wavelength and go out with some wavelength. For inelastic scatterings, photons come in with one wavelength and leave with another wavelength. Anybody remember what Compton scattering is? Yeah, <laughs> good, Kurt. <laughs> and 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 hits. When did you take freshman physics? Oh, uh, <laughs> 66. Okay. All right. So see, so some of you can remember <laughs> still. Um, why was Compton scattering important? <laughs> okay, well, the reason Compton's, what's that? He just remembers the math. He just remembers the math, yeah, not why. Um, the reason Compton scattering was really important was it proved, it was basically proved photons were photons, that they were particles, discrete particles. Because basically with Compton scattering, it's scattering of a photon off an electron, and you can solve the whole thing by just thinking of a billiard bar collision and conservation momentum of the photons and conservation of the photon and electron through the collision and conservation of energy through the collision. Okay, and the idea is when the um, photon came in, it leaves with a different energy, um, different wavelength, and the difference in Compton scattering is the electron is scattered and, and carries some of that energy off. Um, for our inelastic scattering, what we have is a photon coming into the process and leaving with a different energy or different wavelength, which sounds a lot like fluorescence. The main issue is what is the lifetime of the state? When, the, when you have a very short life between coming in and going out, we call it scattering. Longer lifetime, it becomes something like a fluorescence process. The um, strongest... Uh, Inelastic scattering process in water is Raman scattering. Um, even though, in general, compared to a lot of other materials, the Raman cross section in water is pretty small. Um, this is showing you the, ex the emission at 650 nanometers for a excitation at 532 nanometers. So light coming in at 532 nanometers will shift um, <coughs> and emit at uh, 650 through this Raman process. Um, and the free, this describes a frequency shift. I'll talk about that more in a second. So 
Um, Colin, when she talked about quantum levels of molecules and go talking about how you had to have to get into absorption, it had to go from one energy level to another energy level in the quantized energy levels. <coughs> For um, bond scattering, it's sort of cool, is that if you have uh, a photon come in, you can get a uh, excitation that goes up to what's called a virtual state. And a virtual states are pretty cool. They're basically an energy level that doesn't really exist except it, um, it can be there as long as it has a very short lifetime. Remember Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? So basically, the idea with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is it's a combination of a couple variables, has to be less than Planck's constant. Um, in this case, it's the energy um, and the time that that exists combined has to be less than so basically what happens is you get uh, um, excitation for Rayleigh scattering. What it's, you can think of it as the um, photon being absorbed and exciting um, the, the molecules up to some level here, a virtual state, but it exists with a very short time and comes back to the same energy level. So that would be, this is Rayleigh scattering, which doesn't change the wavelength. Um, and then you have Raman scattering, which goes up, and then when it comes down, it goes into a different energy level. And this different is, difference, then, is some energy level in the, um, in the molecule. Um, so, so we have uh, Rayleigh scattering doesn't change. So uh, scattering does change. You can either go this way. Um, where the difference is uh, the difference in the photon that comes off is has less energy, or you can be in an excited state to start with, goes up, comes down, and the energy that it, the photon emitted photon has has more um, energy than it started with. Um, so anyway, but it's sort of these virtual energy levels are sort of cool. They're not real energy levels; they just exist for a very short time. Um, so here's scattering has made up of two peaks, a uh, peak here at 3200 and another one a little bit larger. The ratio between the peaks is a function of the temperature of the water. And um, as early as the 70s, uh, these people, uh, Leonard Caputo and Hogue, who are uh, leaders in uh, LIDAR remote sensing in the ocean, talked about using this to determine water uh, temperature the ratio between this peak and that peak. And um, that's showing you water temperature versus this ratio between the two peaks. Um, the way you use this Raman shift in centi inverse centimeters is basically 1 over the final wavelength is equal 1 over the original wavelength minus that 3200 or 3,400 inverse centimeters. And so you have to convert your wavelengths to centimeters, and that will give you the shift. Um, it works in the natural light field. Historically, um, the way it all came out, which was about when I was starting uh, my postdoc, and so on, um, the community, we were getting these new uh, multispectral uh, radiometers, such as the MER 1032 MEMS, which is what the Viz Lab had. Um, but they had some earlier. Ray Smith and John Tyler at the Viz Lab, other people had um, one off instruments. But there were some really strange results coming out. Uh, when you measured diffuse attenuation as a function, you were getting coefficients that were less than water absorption, would be, than pure water. And so remember, K we think it was supposed to be A plus BB is a good rule of thumb, but you were getting Ks that were less than the water absorption. And so we were, people were trying to figure out what was going on with their instrumentation, what was wrong with it. Um, I spent a lot of time with our MER 1032 out in the, um, that water tank I showed you a picture of yesterday in the lab. So I spent a lot of time in that water tank playing with it, 
with instruments and see if I could figure out why we were getting these weird signals from it, maybe light leakage from a different wavelength or whatever. So we had all this problem. And basically where it showed up with this in K. So here's a plot of pure water absorption. And then the other um, lines are the uh, diffuse uh, uh, radiance attenuation attenuation coefficient calculated from uh, 1 to 5 meters, a measurement at 1 and 5, uh, a measurement at 5 and 9, and then one at 1 and 9. And so all these diffuse attenuation coefficients you would expect to be bigger than absorption of water, but you can see that it's much less than the absorption of water. So uh, we're looking for all sorts of problems. Uh, perhaps leaks, the spectral leaks and filters. Um, basically, in general, it was showing up where the light was the red wavelengths. And so you can see if you have a leak in your filter, that out-of-band stuff I talked about yesterday, if you have a leak in your filter in the blue and you're trying to measure in the red, you're going to get a lot more signal coming from the blue over there and as you get deeper in the water it's going to become more and more important. So there was the concern that was the issue. Well, everybody knew Raman was there, um, particularly for laser excitation, but nobody thought it was very important. Um, a series of people figured out that we were wrong. Unfortunately, this paper in the Japanese Oceanographic Society wasn't put out People didn't seem to know about it until after these papers, and they looked back and realized that the, these guys had figured it out already. Um, but they had a paper in 84. Um, Stalin, Smith, and around there it started doing modeling to realize that Ramon was actually important in the life, and that was what was causing us a problem. So the characteristics of Ramon scattering, fairly weak. Um, Rayleigh scattering at 532 is about 1.8 times 10 to the minus 3 per meter. Um, this scattering coefficient from the line is not order of magnitude less. Um, scattering phase function is a lot like water Rayleigh scattering, um, but there's a higher polarization factor. Um, we'll talk about that tomorrow, I think, more. Uh, the wavelength shift, as I said, is about 3,400 inverse centimeters. Um, the strength varies with wavelength. Remember, Rayleigh scattering is lambda um, for pure for pure Rayleigh scattering. Um, with uh, Raman, it's about lambda to the minus five, but it depends on whether you talk about you're talking about the strength in terms of the excitation wavelength or the emission wavelength and photon energy. So you have to be careful about that. As I said, it's constant, which means that it shifts the wavelength. Um, shifts in the excitation and the emission changes. So this graph just shows the wavelength shift versus excitation wavelength. At um, 400 nanometers, the shift is about 70 or so, 50, 70 nanometers. As you get to higher wavelengths, the shift increases wavelength. This afternoon, as part of the fluorescence lab, we have a Ramon part where I have a, wave, a laser at 405 nanometers and a filter that will block out that light, and so we'll be able to see Ramon scattering. Um, okay. Um, if you look at the natural light field, the reason Ramon's important is that this, I've shown this before, this is the downwelling, this is the upwelling. There's a whole bunch of light in the blue coming down and not much light in the red. So what Ramon's doing is basically taking light here and shifting it over into this area. And so as you go down in the water where the red light starts um, getting weaker and weaker because of water absorption, and there's a lot of blue light still, <coughs> basically there's a lot of chance for you to see this Ramon signal over in the red white lines. Okay. If you go down in the water column, what you see is the red lights disappearing, and so there's a good chance that a lot of the red light might come from Ramon-shifted light from here. 
over into that part of the spectrum. How big a factor is uh, important, as I said, shifting from where it's abundant to where it's small. Um, you, the reason you have to worry about it is you have to be careful of interpreting these wavelengths. These are way too small, so I, I may give you big things. This is 400 nanometers, or so 750. This is 0 to 0.3, and this is the fraction of Raman scattering in the upwelling irradiance profile um, from a paper by Gordon and the, its different solar zenith angles, which doesn't matter as much here. But you can see that um, in above 500 nanometers, say, in um, this pure water, pure seawater, there's no chlorophyll or anything in here, uh, for above 500 nanometers, the Raman um, fraction is about 25% of the light you're seeing in the upwelling. Uh, for upwelling radiance, it's still about 25% of the light that you're seeing for pure seawater. Okay, what's the effect going to be if you start adding chlorophyll? Do you think? What does adding chlorophyll tend to do? Or phytoplankton, pigments, whatever. Okay, where is, what is, what does phytoplankton, what does chlorophyll, what does phytoplankton do? They, they absorbs light, right? And uh, it'll do that a little bit, but where it also absorbs a lot. If we remember our peak, our spectrum, I'm probably asking the question wrong. You, so something looked like that, right? The absorption spectrum, yeah. You're removing blue light, and so that's important because that's the, what the, is doing the excitation to, for the light over here. And so you would expect this function might go down with higher chlorophyll. And in fact, um, the Howard did was he did, uh, he did chlorophyll and the Raman fraction for several of the, for 443 nanometers, 490, 520, 550, and 595. Um, it's the Raman in the uh, normalized water leaving radiance as a function of chlorophyll for um, those different um, I should say, if, if you're looking at 443 nanometers excitate or emission, where was the excitation from that? In general, it's down here in the UV somewhere. And uh, this paper was done by Howard Gordon in 99, and we didn't have very much information about what the optical properties were. So I'm not sure exactly how accurate this was. was. But you see for the other ones, the Raman fraction goes down as you increase chlorophyll. So, how do you measure? Um, you, in the lab, you can do it with 90 degree scattering measurements, um, but you have to be real careful. to be really careful about polarization in your instrumentation. Um, these spectrometers that you have, these benchtop spectrometers, um, the, if you're using a grading or something for the excitation, there's, there's some of these that are called excitation emission spectrometers. Anybody ever see one of those? Um, yeah, so they're, um, they're pretty cool. fingerprint uh, CDOM samples and such like that, the people doing uh, Anyway, each time you use one of those gratings, it turns out this is a polarization sensitivity. So the instruments get to be polarization polarized slightly, and that polarization will change with wavelength. And when you look at uh, emission, there's also a polarization sensitivity on that side in the Thing. So that's going to change. I'm just mentioning that because that caused me a problem early a bunch of years ago. Um, and it also is sort of, uh, it's 
another thing that I, should, I won't get into right now. It causes my is that people don't report, when they look at these excitation emission spectra, they don't do it in terms of quantum efficiencies or something you could use in modeling with transfer. It's all a relative measurement. And, uh, measurement, but they don't do that. Um, so in the field, you can measure it indirectly. Basically, you measure measurements of the upwelling light field, and you model how much remote should be there. And then you look at the difference. Directly, there's this thing called the ring effect. Um, a group at NAS, uh, which is now SPAWAR in San Diego, a group at a and um, Texas A&M, and then uh, uh, we were working on it at UM. Um, the uh, a and group was George Catawar, it was all theory. NOSC was looking at it in terms of specifically this program called Satellite Remo um, Laser Communication. And then we were working with Howard, I was working with Howard and if you're shifting light from one wavelength to another, it's going to be a broadband, the Raman shift is a broadband thing. So it, sh it won't um, be just as you shift from one wavelength to the other, these sharp features should disappear as you get this extra broadband source being added to it. Uh, what you see here is in the blue wavelengths, as I go down in the water column and looking at the downwelling light field, um, basically the shape of this line stays fairly constant versus if I look in the red wavelengths, as you go down in the water column, the line base, the front of line sort of disappears. And so um, why is this one not changing? The Okay, where's the, the, yeah, the excitation from here is coming from probably 400 nanometers. So the light at 480 always stays much stronger than the light over here at 400 nanometers. So, um, so it's not being absorbed as strongly at this wavelength, and also the excitation is never much bigger than here. Versus 653, the, the elastic part is disappearing and there's a lot of light over here at uh, 450 nanometers or 550 nanometers to shift over into this part. So by measuring the depth of these front uh, up, you have to get a measurement of uh, the Okay. Um, you can also use this thing to look at glass and sort of thing, the, um, <coughs> okay, so the top graph is uh, 689 nanometers, the bottom is 518 nanometers. So this is a front offer line in the 518, this is a front offer line in the 690 nanometers section. This is done in the Shark River, um, which is a uh, river in South Florida. Yeah, but, um, in South Florida, there's a lot of mangrove swamps, and the Shark River sort of collects a lot of these mangrove swamps and, and so it's extremely high in CDOM and um, uh, basically if you go out there the water is, is tea colored, very very tea colored because it's basically only CDOM out there. Um, and what you see at these two wavelengths is the front offer lines don't seem to be changing very much with depth. Um, this is, uh, let's see, how does this work? Um, I can hardly read it here. Uh, anyway, at, at different depths, you're not seeing very much change in the front offer lines, which means that the, the inelastic scattering due to CDOM fluorescence really isn't affecting this side. This side is above, we put the instrument, this spectrometer collection fiber, above a brain coral in the dry tortugas. And we, it just sat there as the sun came up, as the light got, field got brighter. And um, 
688 to 691 nanometers. And what you see basically happening is ED, the light coming down from uh, the surface, is basically keeping that Fraunhofer line shape the same as you go down. But if you look, it's sort of interesting, if you look at the upwelling radiance, so I'm looking at a brain coral, and what you see with it is that um, as the sun went up, let's see, so here we have uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. There's not much filling relative to here where these lines got a lot smaller. Okay, and so what we're seeing is there's a lot more fluorescence here earlier in the morning than there is later in the afternoon with this or when the sun got brighter. Um, so it's what I look at it as, as sort of a, a quench, fluorescence quenching effect that you can measure. But anyway, you can measure fluorescence too if you have a fluorescence signal in the right wavelength. Okay, so if you have fluorescence, it's, good, it's an inelastic process. It's going to move light from here into over in this part of the spectrum. If the Fraunhofer line is, it looks like uh, it did in the downwelling signal, then you don't have much of this inelastic scattering going on. That makes sense. There are very little fluorescence over. As, you, as this line fills, as it gets smaller like this, that's indicating a lot more inelastic scattering occurring. Does that make sense? No? No, so the more, the smaller this line gets, um, if it was just elastic processes, this line would stay, these shapes would stay exactly the same. Okay? By seeing the shapes get smaller like this, you know there must be some inelastic process shifting light over into this wavelength. Okay. So, any other questions? Any other questions? No? Yeah. So, I was just pointing out, okay, so in terms of this, I'm just pointing out, okay, this, in this, I'm looking at Raman scattering effects um, with this ring effect and showing how you can do it in natural waters. Uh, this was just showing how you can use the ring effect to also look at fluorescence, separate fluorescence, so separate in some inelastic process, whether it's fluorescence or scattering, from the nat from the elastic process using this ring effect. In fact, they use the ring of they use another place you see the ring effect used is um, for land remote sensing. They have some of these uh, very high resolution spectrometers looking at the surface. And if you fly over uh, land vegetation, you can see the, the, um, this ring effect can show you where plants are water stressed. Looking down at this field, you'll see either less filling or more filling, depending on how much fluorescence is occurring. But it's a way you can separate the, f in a, you know, in the natural light field out there, the fluorescence from that leaf. It's pretty hard to tell, but by looking at the very high spectral resolution, you can see it. Other elastic scattering processes, scattering, which is basically scattering from. Um, from sound waves in, in the ocean. Um, it's very uh, small wavelength shift. It's about seven times 10 to the minus three nanometers. So it's hard to speed changes most rapidly with temperature, so there's an
last process for us. Um, we'll get a whole bunch more about where it's one of those X things where the excitation is going along here and the strength of the emission is going along there and you're seeing diff this is for different kinds of CDOM um, and by looking at these plots you can sort of separate between uh, the different well you try to classify the and what kind of CDOM you have. Um, th these are the plots that are all done sort of in relative units. And, I, and by looking at the Raman in there and changing the instrument a little bit, good quantum of fluorescence efficiency.
so you know, I can say you've got to modify the instrument a little bit. Without that polarizing, there's a special dependence that you're getting on the application. So you're shifting into the modern signal to the possible information. And if you
Hopefully we never get enough natural uh, microplastics in the environment that we have to do. <laughs> <laughs>